if you had a wave packet, tiny, tiny, fitting within a space of a hydrogen atom, and then you let it disperse itself, what would happen? How fast would that dispersal proceed? That is the question. John Harland will answer that question. John uh, it leads our physics study group uh, for Math for Wisdom, and um, he'll talk about how to calculate exactly what will happen. He'll set up, first of all, uh, quantum mechanics in momentum space, in particular, a formulation of Schrodinger's equation. Then he'll do the calculation. Welcome, John. I am Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. Okay, so these are the notes that we were proceeding through last time. And so let me just say that, you know, we have a wave function um, and we have the Schrodinger equation, um, I h bar wave function. The wave function is a function of T and X. And um, we uh, decided last time that that we wanted to turn this differentiation operator into a multiplication operator, and we, and and the way to do that, the way mathematicians do that, is through the Fourier transform. But we're gonna we decided also that a certain scaled Fourier transform, which I'm gonna call f h, like that, um, of a function is equal to the normal Fourier transform. So if we're gonna evaluate it at a certain conjugate variable, say zeta, it's gonna be um, so it's kind of a scaled Fourier transform. Um, so it's the normal Fourier transform would just be this, but instead we uh, scale it by dividing by h, not h bar on the inside, and then dividing by the square root of h on the outside. And it turns out that this is unitary. Just like the Fourier transform. Andres, you still with me? Yeah. And so, um, in this context, unitary means um... unitary means it preserves any, it preserves inner products, so lengths, and okay. it preserves uh, yeah preserves lengths as one to one and onto. So um, and here and here the length is a, so here um, this is your special version of a Fourier transform, and it's acting on the space of like L two functions. Yeah. So is that right, and so the inner product, the notion of distance, is the L two norm. Yeah. So this is which is uh, like an integration. That's right. It goes from L two into L two, and it's unitary in the sense that it preserves the inner product, and and therefore it preserves lengths, um, norms, and and everything. So it's like it's kind of like the, you know, infinite dimensional uh, version of a rotation, you might say, a unitary operator. And um, oh, I see. So unitary see. operators appear appear in a lot of places here. You know, uh, the Schrodinger equation gives rise to a unitary one a one parameter unitary group, um, as we talked about before. It's e to the minus i h bar h t over h bar operating on the initial state where h is of course just this thing on the right side of the Schrodinger equation so 
So H is just negative H bar squared over 2M times the second derivative operator plus multiplication by V of X. So, you know, we get, a, we get unitary operators that way. There's unitary operators like play like a major role, like in a lot of places in quantum mechanics. So this is another example of a unitary operator. That's, changes, changes. And that's from, very, that's, yeah, that's ahead. very helpful for me. Just this connection to say like unitary is like rotations, like is like orthogonal transformations, but yeah. like you're saying it can happen, but it's really about the norm. And so here that norm is this uh, integration of a function Right. Well, squared, let's say, right? So, yeah. um, and they give me maybe that's the cool thing about L two is that uh, it's very natural to have a. It's saying that uh, when you integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity, uh, the function squared, then that will be a finite uh, number. I guess times the constant quantity. So, one question: uh, You write L two of R, but these functions have conjugates, right? Like, is it L two of C? No, no, the, no the, the basic function is defined on R and, and these are complex valued functions. So in other words, this is these are mappings, you know, F if is an L2. Oh, F, these are complex, I see these are complex valued R functions into the on the real line. Right, right. Okay. So the so the the domain is the real numbers and the range is the complex numbers. Um okay. I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah, and in general, you know, the the for three dimensional quantum mechanics, we're looking at R three as being the basic configuration space. Um, so, and we do everything in one dimension here because it's just simpler. You know, the notation is simpler, and but you know, you get the mm -hmm. same phenomena. You get the same phenomena in three dimensional space. Um, so, um, although certain things happen in three dimensional space that don't happen in one dimensional space, for example, the spherical harmonics and the you know the the whole mm -hmm. uh, hydrogen atom does not ex you know cannot exist the way it does in in one dimensional space. So you know sometimes you have to go to uh, three dimensional quantum mechanics to get a more mm -hmm. of a variety of phenomena. But in free space, it just turns out that um, that the phenomena we're looking we're interested in, which is the dispersion of a wave packet, can be demonstrated in one dimensions. Um, so, okay, so what does this do for us? Basically, if we have a wave function, we're going to convert it into a wave, another wave function of this parameter zeta. Later, we're gonna call it P for momentum, but right now we're not gonna assume it's momentum. Um, and which is just this scale Fourier transform of, of psi, um, the way the normal spatial wave function evaluated in zeta. And explicitly, it's just we just take. Psi, we take its Fourier transform and we scale it. It's not x it's zeta. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're wondering what what does this do for us? So, all we have to do is, um, again, the reason you know, sort of the mathematical reason is we're trying to simplify our our treatment of the Schrodinger equation, but differentiation is kind of complicated. So what this mm. scale Fourier transform does is we take the Schrodinger equation, which is um, I H bar, the derivative with respect to T is equal to H the Schrodinger equation, and we just hit it on both sides with this unitary operator. And lo and behold, what comes out on the right-hand side, because differentiation uh, with respect to T commutes with everything that involves X, is we just get
this transformed wave function on the left hand side and on the right hand side um, f and h intertwine in a kind of an interesting way you end up getting as i said last time you end up getting this is zeta squared over 2m So you get, a, you get a different Schrodinger equation. This is our new Schrodinger equation in zeta space. Now, of course, I made a mistake here. When I write things down, I often do. Okay, so everything is now in terms of zeta and t. And, mm -hmm. the great thing, and, and the reason why we use the scaled Fourier transform, you know, the scaling here, is mm -hmm. that when you intertwine, when you actually do this computation and you compute this, you end up getting zeta squared over 2m rather than having h parameters in it, like things involving Planck's constant, mm -hmm. you end up getting a simple zeta squared over 2m here. And so it, it kind of simplifies uh, the look of the Schrodinger equation in zeta space. Mm -hmm. All right. So... And then, of course, this part of the Schrodinger equation becomes simpler, just becomes multiplication by zeta squared over 2m. And this part gets more complicated. It becomes a convolution. Because mm -hmm. Fourier transforms turn multiplication of functions into convolutions. Mm -hmm. Now, what is vh? V, you know, essentially, h is in this because vh of x is just equal to v of h of x. And I'm sorry, this should be the Fourier transform here. Normal Fourier transform. So you pay having this cut a little bit more complicated than in the spatial uh, mm -hmm. Schrodinger equation, but this becomes much simpler, and that leads to a simpler um, treatment of the of quantum mechanics in free space. Because when this is gone, when potential is zero we end up with a part of the Schrodinger equation that's much simpler, it's just, um, mm -hmm. it's a much simpler differential equation than that involving differentiation. Okay. So this is the Schrodinger equation in- uh, Yeah, and this is the Schrodinger equation that, that I that I favor. This is the formulation that I favor. Um, this is what I think of as the Schrodinger equation because uh, it turns out that this formulation of the Schrodinger equation extends to L2, it's a sense of configuration space, classical configuration space. And then you get, you know, when you interpret this in classical configuration space, it actually has a relationship to classical mechanics, a direct relationship mm. to projection. So this is why I consider this the more basic formulation of the Schrodinger. So when you when you're doing your research to link together classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, this is a nice way to this is the pursue them. Yeah, this is the better way. This the this is the part that this is the Schrodinger equation that extends to L2. Sorry. That extends to classical configuration space, which is L2 of R2. The reason why this is classical configuration space is because the R2 includes position and momentum in classical yeah. classical mechanics you can specify initial in, initial conditions of the position and momentum independently and so classical configuration space is actually richer than quantum configuration space okay oh because it doesn't have the constraint doesn't have the it doesn't have the constraint that's right it doesn't have i see it doesn't have the essentially the constraint that leads to the the heisenberg uncertainty principle okay so what is this zeta? Is there some way of interpreting zeta? Well, it sure looks like zeta is, op, you know, is looking like in free space is looking like zeta squared over two m, which makes you think it's momentum. But let's go ahead and verify that in our sort of kosher sense, in the sense of the Born rule. Mm -hmm. And just to just to jump in, um, so phi sub t almost by definition it is given uh, like it's the Fourier transform of the derivative of the wave function. Is that right? Like the Fourier transform of 
the wave function to scale. It's a scale Fourier transform of the wave of the okay. That, and that's kind of like just by definition, right? Okay. Definition, you, yeah. you just chose to define it that way to make it right. I, okay. it, it, it is so that this Schrodinger equation doesn't have you know other thing like h bar sitting in that mm -hmm. term. It's and exactly, now um yeah, yeah that's fair. Yeah, but fair. um the the convolution at some point will you define that or will we need to define it or uh, we're not really going to need it here, but I mean, if you, okay. do, you want, do you want me to write it down what the convolution means? Yeah, why not? Okay. Convolution. The convolution of two functions. So... So that's all the convolution is. And, and so it's an averaging process. Uh, take two functions and kind of average them in this weird way. Um, and Okay, so so and so just to slow you down, but so zeta here, you fix it. Like zeta could be three. Yeah. Right. And then uh, for the value f convoluted with j at three, you'll fix three and then you'll see, hmm, what's happening uh, with the g of 3 minus t, and when you multiply f of t, and then you integrate that, and you'll get some kind of a, that's a, that's an indefinite integral. It'll give you, it'll spit out, a, it's, a, it's a machine. It'll spit out some kind of answer yeah, for 3, but you'll do that for every zeta. Right, it spits out a function of zeta. And, you know, just, just you know, what why convolution is important, you know, regarding Fourier transforms, because Fourier transforms inter, intertwine convolutions and multiplication. Okay, back and forth in the yeah. one way or the other. Okay. And so now, okay, so that's a, that's, a, that's a good introduction to what this yeah, is. Our, okay. our scale Fourier transform also intertwines them, but it uh, up, it it's it ends up scaling things because we have the scaling in mm -hmm. our scale Fourier transform. So we have this, mm -hmm. and um, so. Yeah. That's fine. This is exactly what I wanted was to to get a step in this direction. So let's and now you the, have the Born rule. Let's talk about the Born rule. So the average momentum. Remember from before, what is the average mm -hmm. momentum? It's the momentum operator. The Born rule tells us how to compute average momentum as a function of t. Like that, and this is equal to uh, what is our momentum operator is h bar over i derivative with respect to x. And uh, so we got this before, and this, um, this was the operator that ended up being you know, the thing we're averaging, and therefore we associated that with momentum. Mm -hmm. The momentum operator is h bar over i d d x. That's from last time, right? Yeah, actually a couple times ago, I think. So, um, okay. All right. So just a moment here. Yeah, it's interesting. This I um, is mediating these two, you know, the the derivative with respect to time and the derivative, uh, the the second derivative with respect to space. And yeah, the the, the I is like this rotation, you know, like this ninety degree rotation, yeah, and, saying that you know, gonna, there, there's not, a slack between them. There. Yeah, and it's not it, it's not surprising that there would be an I there because by itself differentiation is anti self adjoint, you know, because the Integration by parts introduces mm -hmm. a negative sign. So you need an I there to make it self. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a single derivative, you need it, you need an I. If you have two derivatives, that's automatically self-adjoint. It takes care of itself. So you got two mm -hmm. you get double mm -hmm. negative when you uh, do integration by parts. So it's it's like a yeah, you need it there to make it self-adjoint. This, you know, this Born rule only applies to self-adjoint operators. Um 
So, and there's a reason, there's a deeper reason for that involving quantum, you know, like quantum probabilities. My, you know, we'll, my, we'll, my, just, my, my gut feeling is that like when you have two coupled dimensions that are like, they're independent, but coupled. So that's where this I kind of helps to express that. Yeah. Like they're in different, you know, like they, they're not directly connected, but they're connected with this coupling factor. When you, you know, when you rotate over, then they'll be connected. You need to rotate over before they're connected. That's just my personal thinking, but why don't I let you go? Yeah. Um, okay. So what, what are we going to do now? Um, Oh, what so we're you were do? saying we, we you were going to explain that this was momentum, right? Like, yeah. So why is this mom? So, so no, I mean it is momentum in position space. This operator is momentum, but mm -hmm. what I want to what I want to argue is that in in momentum space, this operator multiplication by zeta is momentum. Mm -hmm. um, that means that zeta is actually just the momentum parameter. Parameter. Now, let's let, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and work this out. Okay, so this is equal to, because F sub H is a self, is, is a unitary operator, we can slap a, F sub H down on either side here with a bracket. Oh, this is what the unitary comes in, This right? is where unitary comes in, because unitary, if we... Um, you know, remember, um, well, you're explaining, and th this is so powerful because this is true for any, you know, of yeah. these functions, right? For any yeah. L2 function. Yeah. So, so it really means a very strong constraint. It is. Okay. So what do we get for this one? That's easy. That's just phi sub T. Okay. That's what, how we define phi sub T, the scale mm -hmm. transfer. And what's this one? This one. You can show by um, just by direct calculation that th this is going to be zeta times phi sub t. In other words, um, is that because? So do you want me to? Is that because to, it's they're just like constants? Well, because regard to transforms t? turn differentiation into multiplication, right? Oh, okay. I see. The x becomes a zeta, right? Yeah. Except and, it's the mm -hmm. and this h scaling gets rid of the h bar here. Oh, okay. Okay. And the i. And the i goes away because um, Fourier transforms actually don't turn differentiation into multiplication; they turn into two pi i times. So, I mean, we. We'd have to, if you want to go through that, we can we can go through the computation. Maybe maybe that's very good. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. That's very concrete. Let's do it. Yeah. No, I wouldn't know how to do this with if you don't do yeah, it. Let's go ahead and that do would it. be concrete. Okay, why? So let's go ahead and just compute this. F H of H bar over I. This is a very good way for somebody like me to learn by just seeing concretely what's going it's really, on. I don't memorize any of this stuff. I just go through the computation every, each and every time. I, I'm um, like, you know, there's, so Fourier transforms, inter, you know, um, roughly they, they intertwine multiplication with differentiation. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a two pi i or negative two pi i. I, I don't bother to memorize it. I just write it down every single time. So here we go. Um, let's do it. This is one over. I thought you have a psi, psi t in there or phi t. Um, oh, psi. Thank you. And also, yeah. I'm Point but, for me. Let, I've got let, let's let's go. Let, right. yeah, yeah, we better we better do this correctly. And good one, Andres. But, yeah. Okay. So this is one over one over the square root of h times the Fourier transform of this mess here. Uh, 
evaluated at zeta over h. Okay. So this is. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, that's that's applying the. I see. That's the formula for the Fourier yeah. transform that so, you your special cooked right. up version. The special, the special, yeah, the special scaled version of the Fourier transform. So let's go ahead and just write out the Fourier transform. We can pull constants out in front, and uh, inside the Fourier transform here we have uh, dx is going to be the integration variable. I use the mathematician's Fourier transform because it is a unitary operator. Mm -hmm. Physicists. And so the wedge where you put in that uh, parentheses wedge, that wedge is the usual normal Fourier transform. Is that right? That's right. That's the usual. Okay. So we're That's your notation for the Fourier transform. Fourier transform at zeta over h. And then we have the differentiation operator applied to this function here. Integrate by parts. Integrate that, differentiate that. When you integrate by parts, it introduces a negative sign. Now, what justifies integrating by parts? Because when you evaluate the integral, the antiderivative of this at negative infinity and, negative and positive infinity, it's an L2 function, so it vanishes at infinity. It's got to go to zero. Mm -hmm. Got to go to zero. Right. So the only are... integral part, not the, not the non-integral part of integration by parts, survives. This is in in uh, certain areas of math this is like the main trick like in, in pdes um mm -hmm. i mean it's just like you can't believe how important it is um in so and the point being that so so just to restate what you said like as soon as if you have this integral uh indefinite integral with regard to dx as soon as you can have a factor that's partial partial x then when you integrate the derivative and you'll be evaluating at infinity and negative infinity, then you can right. use the fact that at those extremes, the value of the function is going to be zero. So. So we're using that because we're in L2. Um, right. Now, that's sort of fudging things because L2 really isn't. Um, these are not necessarily continuous functions, yada, yada, yada. You know, it's like, you know, there's some there's some fudging going on here. Um, and, you know, you just have to, you, you have to prove a more, you have to prove a more precise theorem that says that integration by parts that works this way in L2. Uh, if, <laughs> if phi t is continuous, then it works. Um, but if it's not continuous, then you have to, you have to generalize integration by parts. Anyway assuming that's already been done in our mathematical background. Okay, so we integrate this. We're, we're using the fact that you have a PhD in functional analysis. That's our excuse. I know, it is. You can, you, all you can trust me. You can trust so, me. I don't have they, to. LeBeg did all this 120 years ago, so, or okay. 130 years ago. So, yeah. Um, so, okay, so we integrate this, integration by parts, and evaluate from negative infinity to infinity it goes away, differentiate that. So let's integrate the first thing. The first thing we integrate it, it becomes that. The second thing, when we differentiate it, or the first factor here, it becomes negative two pi i. Uh, again, we're differentiating with respect to x. So you get that. And, um, and then you get e to the minus two pi i x. So exponentials differentiate like that. But we need a negative sign because integration by parts in introduces a negative sign. So uh, let's put our negative sign right there. Okay. This negative and this negative cancel. This Just I slow me down. I mean, I want to slow you down. Um, we're doing integration by parts in our heads. <laughs> so... Uh, so the way that it works is if you have an integral of uh, uv dx, it would be the integral of the, hmm, it'd be integral of u times v plus the integral of v times u. Is that right? Yeah. It, I mean, I, I like this version. Yeah. And so, and so, pardon? I like and this so, okay, so 
Oh, you wrote it down there. Yeah. Okay, right. Then you put it in that. That's a practical version. I see. Yeah. Okay. And then see, the, so FG is the part that went to zero from B to A. Integrated. Yeah, because, right. yeah, because we're evaluating okay. L, an L2 function. And then yeah. you get a negative sign. I see. So that's where your negative sign. I'm glad you wrote that. That was very helpful. Okay. Right. okay. Okay, so let's just collect everything together. Let's just look. I mean, this is a fun computation. I mean, I, I like I like these kind of computations. I repeat them all the time, and I not get especially if they're doable. I've gotten bored of them. Um, so let's pull everything out, and then what's left over is just this part here, which is the Fourier transform evaluated at zeta over h. This is mm -hmm. a constant with respect to x, so it can be pulled out. So let's just see what that constant is now. So that's just by definition mm -hmm. of the yeah. Fourier transform. The Fourier transform, yeah. And um, so let's see what we got here. We got um, an h bar here. We got a 2 pi h bar. Those cancel. Oh, good. OK. We got an i here. We got an i there. Those cancel. Yeah. We got a negative here. We got a negative here. Those cancel. So the only thing left over is this. The whole thing is jury rigged so that all these things will cancel. That's why I have the scale Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it just ends up being zeta times. Uh, phi t is zeta, right? The Harland rigged Fourier. Harland. Yeah, transfer. so so that means continuing this computation we started above, p, the average p momentum is equal to um, the inner product of zeta times phi. No, my zetas are not well. Yeah, that's a little bit. Zeta, zeta times. Mm -hmm. uh, So I'm just restating mm -hmm. this right here. Okay. So let's. Okay. We, so this is what you. Sh okay. Yeah. So okay. we transform. We transform this Born rule, which made us admit that this was our momentum operator. We transformed it mm -hmm. into momentum space, and it has a much simpler form. And what is this really saying to us? It's saying that this is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of zeta just writing it out with that what that inner product means this is a probability distribution because psi is a probability distribution so is phi because the scale Fourier transform is preserves no oh, because it's unitary again right unitary. so it's a probability distribution so the this probability is... just the probability distribution just to slow you down psi is probability distribution because the integral will be 100 percent equals one and because it's an l2 function uh then when you do the 4a transform it will stay that way here and so that's also a probability distribution yes that's which right. means that it's telling us where something's located so to speak well, it's telling us that the average momentum is the probability average of this parameter zeta. Okay. So there. And, well, this zeta is like a moment in this case, right? Is is that correct? Zeta, well, this zeta is 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 a parameter. It's the first the average value is the average momentum, and therefore. But with regards to with regards to this. Probability distribution, it's also called the moment. Is that correct or not? Uh... Yes, the first moment of the probability distribution. Yeah. Okay. Probability density, yes. Therefore, mm -hmm. zeta can be associated with momentum. Okay. Because we're averaging this zeta over the probability distribution, we get average momentum by the Bowen rule. And it's for this very uh, important and specific uh, probability distribution. Like, so. Right. The basis for 
this whole um, momentum space, this particular yeah. proposition and yeah, so you know, you know, we can, on a different series of lectures, we can talk about in a deeper way why why the wave function gives you a probability distribution. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's the basic setup of quantum mechanics with self-adjoint operators and all that stuff can be <clears throat> viewed in a certain context where at least you're peeling back some layers you know at least it's not just this arbitrary stuff that's thrown mm -hmm. out you know and that's what's called a quantum probability space or whatever where instead of your events are subspaces and so forth rather than rather than subsets of a of a mm -hmm. of a point set um anyway that's for a different that's for a different thing and then you know, some of this mumbo jumbo of quantum mechanics makes a little bit more sense when you think of it that way. Um, we can we can always go back and revisit that. Therefore, we're averaging zeta to get momentum. So we're justified, just like we were justified in calling X position, because its average value gives us the the mm -hmm. gives us by the Born rule the average uh, mm -hmm. value of position. The average value of zeta gives us the average value of momentum. So therefore, zeta is momentum, and therefore we're going to write for now on zeta is equal to little p. Okay. Oh, I see. So you've been kind enough to. So to in momentum it. space. So zeta space is momentum space. And of course, you know, physicists would say, why are you doing all this? I mean, it's just like when you write down a wave, you know, this is related to momentum, you know, so what, you know, mm -hmm. it's the conjugate variable. And so why are you going through all this? Well, because Matt, I'm a mathematician and mm -hmm. I necessarily believe that K is the wave number here. You know, it's like, I, I'm not going to, you know, in other words, I want to, view everything from the point of view of the born rule not classical not the classical analog so physicists develop things through the classical analog of waves you know what do we, how we how do we develop waves in electricity magnetism we, oh i see we wrote down e to the i k x minus uh omega t and that was our wave and k is related to the momentum of the wave and omega is related to the frequency of the wave um and via and T is time and X is location. Yeah, and and then and then you know De Broglie made a connection with momentum here, and you know Planck made a connection with, with uh, energy here and energy, and, mm -hmm. and it, so that's all done. And now it, it's like an analog with wave theory. In other words, classical wave theory. I don't want to do that. I want to do things from the point of view of the Born rule and mm -hmm. the abstract setup of quantum mechanics. Uh, cause you know, that's, that's more my wheelhouse, you know, I don't mind doing this. You know, I think it's a good approach. I think that really to understand quantum mechanics, you have to do it both ways. Um, but, um, well, it may not be the most, it may not be the most fundamental way. Maybe like going in through a window, you know, when there's a door to be found, you know, so it's just a different way of approaching in my or way down through the chimney, you know? So, yeah. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, disparage the, the, you know, the more intuitive, you know, kind of physicist approach to this whole thing. But, um, but to me, this is more fundamental from my point of view of thinking you know where where i want to live you know anyway so um what are we doing oh, okay so <laughs> this whole thing this whole thing is just to get us into momentum space and get us to thinking of sorry thinking of zeta as momentum mm -hmm. and so No, we can do the Therefore, calculation. In momentum, so in momentum space, phi is the wave function in zeta space, which is momentum space. Mm -hmm. And 
i h bar d phi d t is equal to h phi in momentum space. Mm -hmm. Now these are functions of momentum where h is equal to multiplication by p squared over 2m our familiar kinematical energy plus convolution with the scaled mm -hmm. with the scaled um the Fourier transfer of a scaled um, uh, potential. So, so that's our mo that's our Schrodinger equation, momentum space. Um, and wait, 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 wait. Oh, so so where where you have the convolution, you, the v sub h is the scaled uh, potential transform the transform of the potential. And so then you're going to plug in the function that you're operating on into the parentheses. Is that how it works? Yes, that's right. Okay. So just let me, to catch let, up with let, you. Yeah, just to make this notation clear, h by t of p is equal to p squared over 2m. Which is the multiplication part, yeah. Plus... Okay. Oh, and we're calling it P now. So I really just wrote down what we wrote down above here. Uh, where was it? It was this right here. I just wrote it down with P instead of Zeta. Zeta was up here. Zeta mm -hmm. was just a parameter that came out of the Fourier transform. And the, and the Born rule allows us to interpret that as P, as actual momentum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. It's wonderful that you're writing all this out and explaining everything because yeah. once you once you know it, it's obvious for you. <laughs> but, so, but for someone like me, uh, to, it takes a lot of um, thinking to. So here's the punchline in free space. V is identically equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So. No potential. I H bar Oh, and this is relevant for our dispersal that we're trying to calculate. Yeah. So in free space, what happens to the Schrodinger equation? It looks like this. It's just multiplicate is P squared over 2M mm -hmm. times phi T of P. In other words, H is just multiplication by P squared over 2M. Mm -hmm. which is extremely simple. So from our general setup, we know that um, phi t is equal to is equal to um, from our general theory of unitary one parameter unitary groups it's just we take the initial state and operate via this one parameter unitary group, which can be written in terms of the uh, infinitesimal generator, which is the Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. and let's just write this out. This is this operator, e to the minus, um, Multiplication by p i multiplication by p squared over two m times t over h bar. Now, what on earth does this mean? So that's an infinite power series. It does, but I'm gonna I'm gonna argue in a moment that this is just simply e to the minus. I p squared t over two m h bar. This function of p. In other words, this operator, which is seems to be a 
kind of this exotic operator ends up being just mm -hmm. multiplication by a unimodular constant, depending on mm -hmm. P. In other words, it's super simple. Now, why is this the case? E to the minus I H bar T H T over H bar. What does this mean? It means this power series. This is one way of developing it. There's also an integral formulation of this. Uh, there's different ways of this is called the functional calculus. When you take an operator and you plug it into a function, mm -hmm. uh, there's different ways of evolving the functional calculus, but for, um, um, Well, for operators, um, a bounded norm, you can always use this. Formula to write things out is an operator. And then if you're operating on a function, say F, then function just comes inside there. Now, what if the operator is unbounded, which it is, it's an unbounded operator. Um, you know, mm -hmm. for higher and higher P, you're multiplying by larger and larger mm -hmm. numbers. Well, mm -hmm. um, on finite subspaces, there is a there is a bound that's, in other words, this is gonna increase at most exponentially. And this is gonna mm -hmm. kill it by dividing by one over n factorial. So the overall norm of this operator is going to zero as n goes to infinity on a finite subspace. Um, and so, you know, you do, I would say that, you know, there is some justification that has to happen here. You know, this functional calculus involving the summation here involves you know, it always works for bounded operators. For under, unbounded operators, it's dubious. But for mm -hmm. our simple case of unbounded operators, it works. It doesn't necessarily work for all unbounded operators. And you, if you don't, if you don't have this formula working, then you can always use other, other you know, formulations of the functional calculus, like the Riesz-Dunford functional calculus or Gelfon uh, functional calculus. Well, would, would, but well, would it be fair to say that, like? Your underlying assumption is that the phi is uh, L2. It's going down kind of like exponentially somehow. Or or, or in, yeah, like in multiplying by P squared is not going to affect right. that and, quality. And, and obviously, a, you know, obviously this makes sense as a, I mean, this, you know, this unitary operator is always going to have norm one. But the question is, how do you actually compute this? You know, this makes sense. Right. You know, any unbounded. I see, and then you have like a negative p squared, and so that right, and so yeah. Well, so of course, there's an i there. So right. That. So, um, in any case, <laughs> um, we're gonna okay. we're gonna carry through the calculation as though the, as though those subtleties are not there, but uh, we can rest assured that there are ways. You know, if you're un uncertain about this, there are ways of getting around these subtleties. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, I think there's just a direct way in this case, in this simple case, where you don't have to go to any other more fancy functional calculus. Um, so, in other words, the infinite series for e, e, e to the x works for us. Um, and I think you can make sense of it. Anyway, let's just formally plow ahead here as though it does make sense. What does this mean? <coughs> H is just multiplication by p squared over 2m. So this is negative i <laughs> p squared over 2m to the nth power multiplied by f of p. Okay. But this is particularly simple. It's just multiplication by a function of p times f, and therefore f can be factored out of the entire summation. Mm. As far as the summation is concerned, it's a constant. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this whole thing is just one over n squared, and n factorial rather, 
think of I P squared T over two M H in the nth power. That's just a function of P and T multiplied by this function. So this mm -hmm. is equal to, and just using the power series for e to the x, this is just e to the minus i p squared t over 2m h bar multiplied by this function p. This is multiplication by a function. Mm -hmm. And And here it's basically like e to the i theta, Right, I mean, it's like uh, yeah, cosine theta plus i sine theta, basically. That's right. right. This is, is that this is a that's right because this is a real number right here. That whole thing is a real number. So this whole thing is just including e the minus theta. sign, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. This whole thing is a is a real. That's right. So this whole thing is e to the i theta. So therefore, it's on the unit circle. So if norm is one, um, so we're mm -hmm. just multiplying by unit modular function. It's just spinning. Mm -hmm. As t increases, it's just taking and spinning the phase of of our function around at a certain pace, depending on what p is. And it's interesting. It's a. It's an. That's where the quadratic comes in. Like it's an increasing speed, basically, of the right. Yeah. As you, the further you go out, it's kind of like it has more energy, so to speak. The further you go out, it's rotating around faster, but it's. It's always on the unit. It's just orienting, tating the f of p. It's just pointing it in a certain direction. So f of p is like the radius of the number. So, so anyway, this proves this equation here. So we know the initial. So we just basically proved that, right? And, um. So if we know the initial wave function at time t equals zero, we can figure out the wave function at time at time t by just multiplying by this unimodular function. So it's particularly simple in free space. Is if you look at it in momentum space. Now and it's imagine. interesting uh, for me that uh, here it's all momentum. There's no sign of any x. You know, just like in the Schrodinger equation, there's no sign of any P. So like, if you look at how this evolves, like this kind of suggests how it evolves. Like if you know five zero of P, then basically depending on, you know, what P is, the bigger P is, it's just gonna be reoriented, you know, on the unit circle. Five, five zero of P is basically the radius uh, if it's a real number. And then, or at least the real number part of it, it is. And then the rest is just uh, it's just rotating it around, round, round, faster, faster, faster. If you right. have a larger value of p, so larger value of p squared. So at zero, you're not rotating at all. If p equals zero, right. And and as you move out, you just go faster and faster. Yeah. In both directions in p. You're right. So it's kind of like, I mean, it's a little bit complicated in the sense that the the phasor rotation here, you know, depends on P. And, and it's, it's very, very dramatic. It's, and it's happening in a complex plane. If you just see the real component, you'll just be seeing this oscillation, right? Yeah, like you'll you be seeing faster and faster wave. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's, you know, I, I mean, it's something to contemplate, but at least it's understandable and at least it's universal for all free space. Oh, it's interesting. But so with regard to dispersal, dispersal we would normally think of in terms of like it's a constrained X, like I said, like if it's like or you told me, like if it's the hydrogen atom, right? Like, well, it'll depend on the momentum, the dispersal, right? Or not. Uh, well, we have to convert this all into into X if we want to talk about dispersal, right? We do, yeah, because there is no dispersal momentum space. In fact, look, okay. it's happening. The average momentum is equal to it's constant or no constant yeah it's constant it's just yeah.
Oh, so this is conservation of momentum. Is that it right? Is. It is. But not conservation of position, I guess. So the average... Yeah. And, and just to slow you down, like, so, so just to go back down to there. Uh, so what you're saying is that when you do, you when you go there, yeah, when you use Born's rule, you're go down below where you were. I just wanted to no go back to where you were. Yeah. When you use Born's rule as you're doing right there, then we know, and then we know that phi sub t is a probability density. It's a right. I mean, like, is that correct? Or it's a it, yeah a wave function is yeah. So, and then you're just getting the average, and so that average and it's constant because. Uh, Oh, because, because it just when, because it was unimodular. You it was just one. unimodular. Yeah, that's right. And it's it's unimodular. just going to be one, right. size one. So t doesn't. I caught up with you. I get it now. Yeah. And when you do the when you do the conjugate, uh, when you have that um, number in the complex plane on the unit circle, it's times its conjugate will be one. Right. right. So um, so we're almost done. Actually, um, there's not much more to do in terms of writing down the uh, wave packet dispersal in free space, we just have to do a Fourier transform. And oh. uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's just figure out the goal here. Um, and I have to insert a page, I'm sorry. I like- And this uh, is part, fascinating. Part of, why I, part of why I like doing this stuff is that it, it seems sane. You know, there's just so much coming at us right now in the world that you know, people just seem to be unglued. Whereas this stuff is always reliable for me. It's always a calm, safe space, you know, and I don't know, it just seems like grappling with a certain reality that's always there, always just sort of, it's always been that way since I learned, you know, learned this stuff when I was a kid, you know. So, well, and it's also uh, teaching or provoking thinking, uh, and you're a great teacher for me. I'm grateful. Uh, but I, I just think like momentum is conserved. Energy is conserved. Momentum is somehow dual to position, which is not conserved. You know, energy is dual to time, which is not conserved. That's just fascinating. Like, what is that all about? But I think this is yeah, maybe no, connected. It is. Yeah. It is. So okay, we'll so, see what you show us. So let's go ahead. And so let's talk about a wave packet. In a Gaussian wave packet in free space. So we're going to start from an initial position in space of a very ice, a very concentrated particle, and. Mathematically, the simplest wave function to deal with is just a Gaussian wave packet. And maybe I should call this sigma. Oh, I'm going to call this sigma naught. Um, mm -hmm. And then what is the normalization? Well, you have to normalize by dividing by this. But of course, it's the square of the wave function that's a probability distribution, so you have to do that. Mm. And that's why there's a four here, not a two there, because the square of okay. it. Okay. And that's the L2 again coming in. It's an L2, right. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're integrating the square. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we need. So there is going to be a initial state here that we can write down. I mean, you know, we can write down these computations if you want. Um, but let's let's just okay. So that's that, and of course, that's going to also be a Gaussian. Okay, Wait. and this is uh, this is in the momentum space now. You're switching over from position space to momentum space using the Harland Fourier transform. Yeah, H right. 
that's what that stands for, Harland. That's right. I never thought never thought that before, but yeah, no, you're right. That is Harland. Um, yes. Unconsciously, that's what I was doing all the, all along. Um, and uh, they might as well just call it Harland's constant. I mean, come on. So, um, anyway, I'm not gonna. I'm. You know, we can write that down. Uh, we can do a Fourier transform, mm -hmm. and I'll show you. I'll show you the mechanics for doing that in just a moment. But that means that phi sub p of t is just equal to um, just our exponential e to the minus i. And I have to remind myself it's p squared. And what, what are the ingredients here? Blah, blah, blah. Where is it? Where are you? Yeah, and this is the, we're, the t is the Wait. dispersal part. We're Wait. starting at zero, but then we're oh going to t. Oh, my goodness. I inserted things at the wrong place. So let me take this. I'm going to take this page. I'm, I'm totally in the wrong part of the document. So I have to take my page. I have to cut my page. I'm going wow. to move it to the bottom here, and I'm going to append cut page. Append. This is very fancy. It is, yeah. So okay. Is, okay. we did it. Anyway. You did it. Good job. Okay. So anyway, it's um it's that. Okay, so okay. Mm -hmm. I P squared T over two M H bar. And um, that's going to be times r phi naught p. So, I mean, you can immediately write down the time dependence um, of the wave packet in momentum space just by multiplying by this unimodular function. Right. And that's what we've been talking about, right? Like this whole uh, rotating round and round. Okay. So, and now then we can go ahead and compute what it is, what it looks like in position space, because that's kind of what we're interested in to connect back to our intuition. And oh, now we're going back. I see. And so we start mm -hmm. the inverse Fourier transform, scaled Fourier transform of five t mm -hmm. evaluated x, and this is just going to be what is it? Well, not surprisingly, it's the inverse Fourier transform of um, by t uh, inverse Fourier transform evaluated x over h. So we can do that, and here's what the formula looks like. It's not surprisingly a Gaussian wave packet. Mm, that's why you picked it. It is its own Fourier transform, basically. Right. Okay. So you get just this wave packet, but with this definition for the, this is what it, you know, work out all the mathematical details. Where are you? Okay. Now I have to. Okay. Now I have to look at another part of my notes where I write this down. And I want to make mm -hmm. sure that I write, write this down correctly. Just, just give me a moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely going to start out with that, but it's going to have some uh, other stuff in it. It's going to look a little bit disturbing. I H bar T over two M. So you end up getting this and I'm sorry, this should be a Sigma sub t. So you end up getting a Gaussian wave packet, but with this complex um, variance. Hmm. Which grows over time. Grows, which grows over time. 
and no, it grows the... linearly, but with the complex, it, right. it's imaginary so, that grows so, linearly. So this is the wave function, but the actual probability distribution, we can work that out. Um, but this variance is showing the, so there's two things here. Oh, and I'm because sorry. Because you've quite, chosen, I mean, because. It, it, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I've shown you isn't quite right. Um, I'm sorry. I have to. So we have to be a little bit careful here. You don't quite get, yeah, this, this is the complex version of, of, for complex variance, you need the initial variance and then the comp, and then the complex variance here. So it's, the formula isn't quite exactly the same as this one right here with a real variance, with a complex variance, um, you need the initial real variance over the complex variance squared uh, in order to, in order to pull this off. So, um, so, and I can go through all the computations, but it's really just a matter of doing a forward Fourier transform on a wave packet to get that, multiplying by this unimodular, easy, and then doing the inverse Fourier transform. And so there's some computations involved here. And I could talk about the core formula you, you need for these computations in just a moment, but... Um, do you have time to go through the computations today, or would you... Um, maybe, I, I probably don't have... It's fine because it's it's well let, let's see how far we can go in the, like the next 15 minutes okay but what but I maybe want... just yeah just maybe to state my understanding as limited as may be but uh, if you just go up a little bit the point being that you defined uh in position space you defined the gaussian you right. chose the Gaussian as this most simple thing in free space because the Fourier transfer will also be a Gaussian, basically. Now, and so when you started with the initial wave packet, you ended up in momentum space. And then in momentum space, you had calculated this nice uh, evolution of the wave function in momentum space that made it very straightforward. You were able to do that. So right. now that you go from phi sub zero to phi sub t, then you take the inverse Fourier transform back and you will get this Gaussian, but now it'll have a variance that's changing uh, and it'll have uh, the original real variance now is going to be a complex variance with this linear uh, growth factor, I uh, h yeah. bar over 2m. Right. So you it's it. saying that the, the in the position space, it's spreading uh, and in our discussions previously, you had thought, oh, it must be spreading exponentially or something, maybe because, you know, this is Fourier stuff. But no, it turns out when you do this calculation, it's actually linear. It is. Uh, and then you can actually talk about, like, if it's going faster than the speed of light or slower than the speed of light, yeah. depending right. on particular conditions, right. depending yeah. on H bar and 2M, let's say, and yeah. and the original. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being a little stingy here. Let me just write out what this um what this really is this is going to be well it's going to be a gaussian it's going to be one over two pi mm -hmm. square root of two pi um times this um uh times let's call it you know find out p i'm going to put a little superscript on it And uh, this is going to be e to the minus b e squared over four variance squared. <laughs> well, this is an awkward notation. Awkward. Um, let me just let me just subscript it with a p here. So it's the initial variance for in momentum space. And okay. what is that variance? It's uh, I've got that written down here. It's what is the variance? Yeah, and the more you can write down with the calculations, you know, anybody watching this or me yeah, rewatching this. Will H really bar squared over four. It's H bar. So it's a reciprocal basically of the the spatial variance with some scaling. Mm -hmm. And the scaling, of course, you know, we've done a funny Fourier transform here to get to. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and I'm sorry, there should be a Fourier transform there. 
Um, so because we've done this funny for you transforming, we get this, we get this um, scaling in the in the variance, but that's basically we get another wave packet in a momentum space, not surprisingly, that is Gaussian because the Fourier transform on Gaussian was Gaussian. And not surprisingly, its variance is sort of the reciprocal of the spatial variance. So the higher the spatial variance, the lower the momentum variance and so forth. That's, so that's Heisenberg's uncertainty so principle. Basically. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. In fact, we can just go to the computer if you want. So taking square roots. So we're getting we're getting the minimum of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle here with Gaussian wave packing. Sometimes it's greater, mm -hmm. but this is exactly equal. Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, it all works out. And you know, I mean the formulas are a little, you know, they've got some some annoying scaling factors in them and stuff, but they're actually, you know, it's kind of nice. It's not a not a hard formula in the end. And, and can I ask so how did you get there? Or is that not clear? Or is that clear? Here's the basic computation. The here's here's what you need. All this hinges on this formula here. So you need to prove this mathematical formula. And what is this formula? I think it, I think I can write it out. It's the it's like a Gaussian oh. type of situation. Yeah, it's like how do you how do you compute a Gaussian integral in general? Especially when that integral is complex, because I mean, look what's going to happen. You know, we're going to end up with complex Gaussian. Integrals. I see. So, how do you do it when A and B are possibly complex? And you know, it takes a little bit of it takes some elementary complex analysis to actually do this computation. You have to mm -hmm. you have to do a contour. Well, I do it with a contour integral. It could probably be done other ways, but let me just let me write this out. I got this formula written. Hundred times in the notes, and I was looking for it. I mean, I think I think it is just the real part of a has to be greater than zero in order for this integral to converge. Okay. Okay. And that's assuming there's a minus sign. In and what yeah. is the what is the square what is what does this mean to take the square root of a complex number? Well, what it means to take the square root of a complex number is if the real part of a is in the complex plane and it's over here, we take the principal branch of the square root function. You know, there's a problem with the square root function in the complex plane, right? It it's multiple valued. So you have to take the principal mm -hmm. branch, which involves excising the negative real axis. That means you can take the you can take the square root of anything you want. And what it does is it multiply, it all does is it takes and takes the modulus and takes the square root of the modulus, the the the, the length mm -hmm. of the complex number, and and divides the angle by two. So anything that starts out in the right half plane mm -hmm. is end up here. In this part of the half plane, this is, you know, the square root of a mm -hmm. is going to end up here, and so square root of a is going to end up in that ninety degree um, uh, uh, tilted quadrant, yeah, tilted, mm -hmm. tilted, whatever you know, tilted sector or whatever, and uh, and when you take its one over it, it's also you know, any complex number that's in this uh oh, in, this, I see. in this wedge here, yeah. when you take when you take its one over it is gonna also be in the wedge. 
and mm -hmm. uh, and then of course you're multiplying by the square root of the pi, so that's not going to change its whether it's in a wedge or not. So it's going to end up in there. Just to get this right, a one over is going to uh, change the modulus um, if it's big to small and vice versa, and it's going to uh, give you the negative angle. That's right. right? Yeah. So the angle. But so long as it's in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, because this wedge here is um, invariant under under multiplication, you know, under angles being reversed. Right. Then it's going to still end up in the same wedge when you take. Mm -hmm. And pi is not going to change things; it's just going to scale the modulus. So, so, so the b turns out to be inconsequential. Is that inconsequential. right? Inconsequential, inconsequential, because you know, just with normal change of variables, and right. the okay. b is real. You can see that from a normal change of variables. Um, and because you're integrating from infinity to minus infinity, so it's just um, that that local shift is irrelevant in the big picture. And you better have whereas a is scaling it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And you better have real part of a greater than zero, otherwise you got a divergent integral here. And so, the other thing is that it's because it's negative a. So if a is big, it's actually a smaller area. It's it's cutting down. If a is small, it's actually a bigger area. If it's modulus, because it's e to the minus a, yeah. x squared, right? Right. Okay. So it, it's a little, you know, it's a little bit of math here, right? I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's a little beyond calculus to talk about integrals. Okay, with, but this is a, you know, you're not proving this formula, but it's a classical formula. This can be looked up in its, um, but, yeah, but we're going to use it. So yeah, how, how would you? You could use contour what? integration. You, you just, um, mm -hmm. you just, you know, you change your contour to be, you know, like I, I forgot how I did, but it's it's like you know once you know well one the, one thing I think like e to the minus x squared uh, that is done sometimes by looking at uh, you have r squared and you have a uh, x squared plus y squared I think something like that right there's that type of reason. yeah that's where the square root comes in I think I forget um, but um, yeah. I can yeah, we can look that up. Yeah, right. Um, uh, but so, how would you use this formula? Maybe that's more relevant. Well, this is how, how this is, is this? Well, this is involved in computing the Fourier transforms, uh, because the Fourier transforms. Oh, okay. So when yeah. you calculate the Fourier transform, you have to be able in, to do in, that integral and the inverse I Fourier see. transform too. So you need to be able to compute right. those integrals. And so this is the basic formula that allows you to compute those integrals. Can so, you make those? Or, okay, so once you have, but then I think the things that, in order to kind of like give out the more details, maybe the crucial thing, I mean, those Fourier transfers, just to write them out nice would be fine. Uh, but uh, but uh, even someone like me, I can look them up in Wikipedia. How do you do that? But but in terms of the sigma t squared equals sigma zero squared plus iht over two m, how do you get that formula? Like how, that seems the crucial thing. Like how do you define sigma t squared? How do you get that? Well, again, it's um, you know you're gonna you're gonna find out after you do your Fourier transforms that this you know you're gonna end up with this formula here. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, because because of because of this because of this basic computation. And then you're mm -hmm. going to collect things together and say, oh, my God, we have this, you know, this thing. And that's of that form. And it's just going to, it just come, it's just a way of, it's really just a way of, it's really just comes out of the computation. Um, well, and so, so first of all, like, just the way I envisage it, it you wrote sigma sub t squared to make it nice and simple and understandable now. But when you actually do the calculation, what you'll get is you'll get like sigma squared plus IHT over 2M. You'll be getting a term like that. Is that well, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so then you have to realize that, oh, that'll be the variance in the new situation. Yeah. Or the variance squared, right? That's like, right. so so that whole calculation, I mean, it's um, gnarly maybe, but I think maybe yeah. for a future video or this video like it's i think it's for me it's very helpful to see the whole guts of it like you know what's yeah, going on and, here. and there's a you know i mean 
you know, to navigate through this whole thing, you know, you can imagine that when you take the Fourier transform of this, you got to multiply by e to the minus uh, two pi i x zeta. And so you get an x squared term and you get an x term. So you have to complete the square to be able to Ooh, use this form. Okay. And when you complete the square, certain things come out and then you end up with this formula, but with some stuff on the outside here and that the stuff on the outside is all important in terms of the computation. So uh, it's complete. Okay, it's about completing the square. I see. Completing the square together, the with this, together with this basic formula or what allows you to navigate through this stuff. So there's 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 some there's some technical details i mean we can yeah next time we can go through this computation it's it's well or even fun. even if you if you sent me your notes i could share your notes just for anyone who made it this far right like well you mean the ones i wrote for myself well or or we can do it next time oh my god yeah, I think, like, see i think the point is I mean, this is the point be. okay so then maybe we'll do it next time one more time uh this is just slogging through uh yeah i think pedagogically for me um i think like where you really shine is just your whole mindset towards this because it's your aesthetic right uh, you have this aesthetic of the big picture this mathematical kind of like purity this physical intuition and so you have a very rich aesthetic that you're contributing to this and, you know, you're picking um, very uh, simple, um, uh, illuminating issues, examples to calculate. You're doing the calculations. The calculations may be, see, then the pedagogically, the issue is this. The calculations are kind of like technical, maybe, quote, unquote, not so interesting, not so clean, kind of messy. you got to do different things. But see, that's what a person like me needs to see in order to really have any clue as to what are we talking about. Like, so it's kind of trivial for you or technical or kind of like um, not pretty, you know, just kind of, you know, just like hacking with a machete through the jungles, let's say. Yeah, I mean, like my it's own. Not, there's no mountain view. But see, that's that's the part where like I can't proceed if I don't see those calculations. Yeah, but so see, you to, when you so. when you said, oh, it's completing the square. Oh, it's using this. All of a sudden, I can kind of see it. Now, maybe yeah, I could yeah. do it. But, right. you know, I'm lazy. Like if you showed me all the steps, I think then it would be. Uh, yeah, I think we should do it. We, I would. We should, yeah, we should. We should drive these formulas. I, I think it's a good idea. But in the end, mm -hmm. um, the you know, the the part that I was driving at is really mm -hmm. this one right here. This is sort of the crowning formula that tells us that, um, well, together with the, the variance, tells us the wave packet is spreading out in space. It's it's not spreading out in momentum space, but in 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 position space, it's spreading out, and it's spreading out actually not that fast mm -hmm. um, but it tells you that if you look in any one area of space you're going to find that um that it becomes less and less likely to find your particle in that in that area of space and it decays roughly as one over t the the probability of finding in any region of space um your particle which means that there's pretty good persistence of a of a free particle, but you better look pretty fast. You better not dilly dally before you start looking for it, because after twice the amount of time, it's going to be half the probability of finding it. And um, but if I you know, if what I said was true, you know that it decays exponentially, which it doesn't. Imagine mm -hmm. the difficulty of detecting anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would just be like things would disappear immediately. And it's almost like the universe wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like nothing would ever be able to interact with anything else. Like, I, I think that, you know, the fact that there is this persistence that, that, that position persistence is quite robust, you know, is kind of what gives rise to interacting universe maybe it's it's one of the key ingredients anyway the other thing is how fast is a wave packet actually spread out like if it's for example if mm -hmm. it's if this was a hydrogen atom so 
this initial electron was confined to maybe 10 to the minus 10 meters. Mm -hmm. uh, how fast is this average variance spreading out? And it turns out it's spreading out, I think, at about something like, I, I forgot it was 2% of the speed of light or half a percent, but it is a, it is a percent, I think it's half a percent of the speed of light. The variance is actually increasing. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, that tells you that there's relativistic effects that are going to be measurable, that are not going to be negligible. In fact, the one over three, 137 fine structure constant, I think, is related to that. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the spread of this wave packet, we're going to find out, is exactly what you get from the uncertainty principle. And so, so you can do that as part of the calculation, right? Like, uh, right, right. Yeah, we can, we can, you know, we, do well, we can, we can it, really, the calculation is a technical thing, but then interpreting this formula that I just, yeah, that is, is kind of like what I just said, where we can calculate the spread of the wave packet, how fast the variance is increasing as a function of time. And, and, uh, and this is a very, this is a very good tutorial for me. It's a very uh, great uh, classical situation. In a certain sense, it's, like it's very real mentally, like, you know, at least in terms of understanding the conditions of these, let's say, like electron in a hydrogen atom, kind of like. But when, what, what I'm making progress with my study of this alternative to the wave function uh, based on the orthogonal polynomials, their combinatorics. And so looking at something like this spread uh, from that, if the, you know, the, if I can hang in with you in the calculation, then I can maybe look at that and say, hmm, uh, well, maybe this is related to random walks, you see? And maybe that's what this spread is really all about, you know, the way that a random walk could be kind of like spreading in variance, let's say, right? Um, well, exactly. Um, I mean, random walks are uh, like a Gaussian spread. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, yeah, look at the, if you look at the formula for, random walk i think it does spread exactly like this um in other words well, the binomial the theorem is basically like a random walk i think in yeah a so sense. i think i think if you if you take this and just take the modulus squared of this mm -hmm. uh, you get the formula for a random walk for a, for a spread out from a random walk oh, we can do it together if you want um in fact i think we ought to do it because that's how we're going to actually interpret this spatial spreading of this wave function, we're actually going to compute the modulus squared of this of this to get actual right. Gaussian wave packet. This is a complex Gaussian wave packet. Of course, the 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 wave function itself is typically complex value. You start off with a real valued initial mm -hmm. wave packet, but you end up getting a complex value. So packet. and you have you have these strengths like functional analysis, real analysis, um, physical intuition. Uh, but I do have training in the combinatorics, algebraic combinatorics. So uh, it's interesting to try to, like, it, it may be that actually um, that actually works too, you know, like in terms of what, right. it's just, uh, it's beautiful. I, I'm just glad I'm learning from you. I think I just feel uh, like I'm learning and I, I, I haven't... Um, I think I need to see the calculations in order to absorb like the uh, the punchline of this all. But what I think what I did absorb was the fact that uh, if you can go from the initial state in uh, position space to the using the Fourier transform to the initial state in a momentum space, well, evolution in momentum space is very uh, straightforward to uh, describe. And then you can go back and see what that evolution gives you using the inverse Fourier transform what it gives you in the uh, position space at any time t. That's what you did. Right. right. That's what I understood. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so, that's what I but, did. That's what I did. Yeah. And so it looks like momentum space is just sort of a trick. And um, yeah. Okay. No, I think, uh, no, momentum space is the natural space for evolution. It's, that's what it's saying in yeah, time. Yeah, maybe. You know, it's another, another way of thinking about it. Um, so um it's all stop sharing uh but yeah i mean there's there's the from here there's the computations mm -hmm. of all this stuff which is fun and we can go through it um and uh it's really not i mean 
it's it's um a really i think you're talking about a couple pages of computations you know it's not yeah you know because completing the square is a little tedious and so forth um, well maybe doing that but, integral uh also the contour integral if no yeah, i could do that we could do that too you know um so those those details we can go over but more important i think in the end is interpreting the spreading out of the wave packet and actually seeing you know for uh you know an initial confinement of a certain number of angstroms how fast do we expect this thing to spread out it turns out if you have an initial confinement of like 10 to the minus 15th meters so say um a ten thousandth of an angstrom i believe this thing spreads out the wave packet spreads out like the speed of light you know i mean the average variance mm -hmm. you know so yeah so like to, to i think that's very good to be able to not relativistically consistent, you know, like to have a confinement like that. And so to to have uh, those those calculations done explicitly, like, you know, you said, you know, 2%, we'll half that. percent, whatever, yeah. like if we walk through that, like, see, that would be very informative yeah. for me too. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah, we should do that. Um, we'll do that. What we'll do is we'll compute the modulus squared of the, of the wave function. That is a probability distribution with an actual variance. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just... Uh, we'll look at the rate of change of the variance, which is sort of the um, average spread of the average spread of the packet, the rate of change of the variance, and then we'll get a velocity out of it, and we'll we'll find and, out. And it, I just wanted sure. to ask uh, if um, if the momentum was relevant in terms of the spread of the location or not. I didn't really catch that. It's not relevant, right? What your momentum is. Well, your momentum has this predictable quality to it that it it the phaser associated with momentum and momentum space <clears throat> gets more intensely uh, the the frequency increases very dramatically with the with with momentum with the square right well yeah that's right it increases with the square of momentum and so the phaser you know, <clears throat> is actually spinning faster and faster as you go out on the tails of momentum space. And that causes, um, that has an effect on position space of the spreading out of this wave packet and position. Oh, it position. does affect the spreading out of the wave yeah. packet. Very much. Okay, so to see like in the formula, in the calculation, like where is that coming in? Uh, yeah, so you know, that's that. Because I didn't catch that today. That's the so. specific, that's the specific co co computations that you have to do. To go mm -hmm. from momentum, well, position to momentum space and then back to momentum space. That's the Fourier transform is really going to do all that for us, together with that mm -hmm. integral formula that allows us to compute uh, Gaussian integrals. Um, so there is some technique, you know, there's some machinery here, but it's, you know, <clears throat> on, the, on the scale, quantum mechanics and quantum field theory is pretty, it's, you know, pretty basic stuff, you know. Um, but still, so Mm -hmm. But it, so those are the thing, you know, the actual computations might be of interest in them. <clears throat> interpreting this as a spreading of a wave packet and to understand how fast that packet spreads and then to circle back to the uncertainty principle to get the exact same prediction from the uncertainty principle. That's mm -hmm. that's kind of that's kind of what can, I think, complete this. And, but then there's other places we can go, like. For example, why are self-adjoint operators, why, why do those correspond to physical observables? Oh, why do we use Hilbert space at all? Um, that actually can be unpacked in terms of what I call the mm -hmm. on a probability space or what you know, authors, various authors call um, various things. Um, you know, why is it? events are associated with subspaces rather than sets of points like they are in classical mechanics why are they associated with subspaces so this is this is like another subject but it's it, it's at a more fundamental level than than what we're doing here it's like the justification for the basic axioms of quantum mechanics can be unpacked in, in terms of all that stuff and that's actually interesting to do too you know i think it'd be helpful for you to know that and so these, I, I'm I'm glad for these tutorials. Uh, these are for me personally, but I but I'm glad that we can share them with anybody who's viewing because uh, um, it's just uh, 
investigation of yours and of mine that's hopefully can be meaningful to people. Um, just uh, like the thoughts that you bring up, like this events are subspaces, let's say versus points. Uh, I'm working on trying to understand bot periodicity, how it could be expressing these cognitive frameworks. And uh, a crucial thing about bot periodicity is it's cycling through different Grassmannians, different flavors of Grassmannians, which are basically different flavors of vector subspaces within spaces, right? So, and the the interesting thing being that in the degenerate case, subspaces of spaces becomes subsets, subsets of sets. So you basically get, there's like what the binomial theorem counts, let's say subsets of sets. So yeah, yeah. Okay. the Grassmannians of different kinds are kind of like saying, well, First of all, like if you had finite fields, you could have the Gaussian binomial coefficients. So you have these polynomials instead of integers, you would have polynomial factors and whatever, you know, polynomial factorials. So that's counting in a finite field of uh, subspaces of spaces. But then if you have a real or complex or quaternion uh, vector spaces, then um, you can have different combinations of spaces and subspaces and stuff. And then you can go up different. And so bot periodicity is managing how you walk through, cycle through all of that based on Lie groups, Lie algebras. Uh, so that whole notion, like, well, events are subspaces. You see then it for me, oh, ding, 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 like that'd be interesting to uh Yeah, no, about. I think I think it's important for you to know that, yeah, to, to see that formalism. And um, so I'm trying to, mm -hmm. you know, to turn, you know, come up with my own version of it because, of course, I'm, you know, I'm never satisfied with one exposition of it that I, you know, I, I have to look at multiple expositions and try to make try to make sense on my own. It, um, so yeah, let me let me and, let me think more about that. Yeah, you know, before we before and just we get much into it, another angle. And so mathematically, I'm currently working on these uh, orthogonal polynomials, making slow progress, uh, but I I hope to get there. But after that, um, one thing I'm very excited to study. Uh, going again into the bot periodicity is the angle that really will connect with those cognitive frameworks metaphysically seems to be the CPT symmetry, which is in the tenfold way of topological insulators. And I found some good readings on that. Uh, but basically, um, you know, whether there's time reversal or not, or this charge conjugation, you know, whether particles and holes are different or not, uh, whether there is um, parity, you know, like if you reflect the universe in a mirror, you know, you get a mirror universe, is it going to have the same physics or not? You know, those types of questions depend and you get different combinations. And so those combinations give you real eightfold bot periodicity and twofold uh, complex bot periodicity. Well, it's all coming out of random matrix ensembles. And so um, those random, and they're called Gaussian ensembles. So like, you know, this whole Gaussian type of thing and it's again about you know this unitary or orthogonality or whatever. But uh, when you have an orthogonal matrix, I think it has to be symmetric, right? Is that uh, so? Um, uh, well, is that how it works? Or no, no. Uh, Self-adjoint matrices are symmetric. The orthogonal matrices, if you take the conjugate transpose, you get the inverse. So well, unitary matrices. If you take your, or if you take yeah, the, well, yeah, you, unitary matrices. Matrices. So, so with orthogonal, matrices, orthogonal matrices, if, you know, if, you if you have take real, trans, see if you have so, real entries with orthogonal, it's symmetric. Is that right? So, so yes, it's it's not symmetric, but it's conjugate. Its transpose is not equal to itself. It's equal to the inverse of itself. An orthogonal mm -hmm. matrix. It's con. It's it's transpose is the inverse of itself. Oh. Then I have to think about this again. It's very much but, related to symmetric matrices, and that that well because of the Lie algebras, or how does it work? Or well, yeah, I mean there there's a connection there, but because well, let's see. Um, so it's Lie algebras would be skew symmetric, like the Lie algebra of an orthogonal group would be skew symmetric matrices. Okay, or? so I'm I'm not understanding. I mean, the many important details, but what I kind of caught that I want to share was that the in the case of like symmetric matrices, basically, you see, the point being that 
if you know that a matrix is symmetric, and I guess products of symmetric matrices are symmetric, is that right? Uh, if you uh, if they're if they're commuting, no, if they're not commuting, it they're not necessarily symmetric. They okay. have to <laughs> maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong then. Well, I thought if th there's a condition like that, let's say where it's based on the shape of the matrix, basically, right? And it's and it, let's say it's preserved by multiplication, hopefully. Um, but the point being that see, then when you have random entries. Um, you're you're staying within your class, whatever it is. So when they talk about these uh, Gaussian ensembles, I think that's what they're talking about. Like, you know, you want something that uh, on the one hand is, let's say, orthogonal. On the other hand, like it's preserving a class of random matrices okay. where they, they're, they're keeping the quality that you're interested in. And so it turns out like if you insist on that, there's not a lot of ways it can go. And I think maybe like, there's a certain way to construct the constraints where it's just orthogonal. These they're called Gaussian orthogonal ensembles or Gaussian unitary ensembles or Gaussian symplectic ensembles. You see, and those are the three basically building blocks. And that's this the building easy. blocks for this all this bot period, this, this uh, CPT met metaphysics. So yeah. these, if I can understand the random matrices, I could understand where all this metaphysics is coming from. So like, you know, charge conjugation, well, that's based on random matrices somehow. That's what I'm trying to say. It, it, it certainly has a flavor of something I'm interested in, you know, and that I. Um, oh, so okay. what you're doing is you're by giving me these tutorials and teaching me, you're teaching. I think you're also kind of communicating your beautiful, wise um, math, physics, aesthetics, you know, for the framework. But you're constructing a language that's probably a good language for relating quantum mechanics, classical mechanics. And that's the language where, oh, if I could learn that language, then I have ideas that I could try to introduce that would connect with wondrous wisdom with the cognitive frameworks. That's, I think, what the, so this may seem rough. What well, This is rough what we're doing. You know, you're getting these talks, but this is just a way of getting this material out as a set of notes. Yeah. And then it'll be a second right. run, and a third to, run. To be, it'll become quite polished. Be accept, to be accessible to other people, we need to, you know, it needs to be, it needs to be refined. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, and really, in in the in the context of a, a expository talk, a lot of details can be left out, but some details need to be there so that people can believe what's going on, right? So maybe we can, you know, you can help me kind of decide what needs to stay and what what can go in the end you know and then I and can it make... depends on your audience right and yeah so um but regarding the random matrices it does seem like it's it's relevant to what i'm interested in it 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 i don't know it's just a hunch you know that somewhere in there is it's a beautiful maybe, it's maybe a... this factor of time the, the the factor of two in time um i mean i have a a certain picture i think it it, it it fits in it fits in with all the things you love you know like when you're into dynamical systems thinking so obviously like this this just seems to be of the flavor that you would um yeah. you know that you would uh, believe in like that things like that could be fundamental right yeah. like right. you know an, an, an evolutionary perspective is one that kind of uh respects randomness as a uh, fundamental process right like that yeah yeah and you know my like a primitive so one of one of my uh, ideas in the circle of ideas that i've been working with is that entropy you know maximum entropy isn't kind of enforced by all this um in other words it's sort of extra dynamical selection going on um and somehow ma random matrices may be the the most plausible way of arguing for a universe in which in which selection you know you have maximum you have maximum microscopic disorder which means about half of the half of the states are surprising you know half the time you're utterly surprised and you have to reject <laughs> reject the plausibility of the reality there in other words that gets cold away That's exactly the situation where you have maximal disorder half of the time. Uh, in other words, it's completely unpredictable whether you're going to 
not be surprised or be surprised by what comes along. And uh, and then the time overhead involved in that kind of calling would be two. That's the factor of two that you're mm -hmm, yeah. trying so, to. But to justify all that, I don't think it's going to be, it's not going to come out of like the Dirac formalism or the Schrodinger formalism. I think it's got to come out of something else. And random matrices might be the way of justifying it. So, and just just to kind of look ahead, half a year or a year, or you know, but with regard to math for wisdom, um, uh, Jerry Northrup, um, who's um, you know got a PhD in biophysics, but he's basically an eco technologist. But in his philosophy, the maximum entropy principle is absolutely um, like key, uh, just for how nature solves things. Let's say, right? right. So um, it'll just be cool, like you're able to ground things like that in a, you know, in a kind of a physical realm, we'll see. But there's somebody who will be interested to connect with that. Or now we have a new uh, participant, uh, Daniel Friedman, uh, who is very, um, he's a president of the Active Inference Institute, and which is based on Carl Friston, uh, the neuroscientist's work, where basically saying like the brain is a machine that uh, is trying to minimize uh, surprise, mm. you see. So this what they call the the free energy principle. I think it works that like you're you're trying to. Well, that's that's about as I was say. So I'll be learning more about that. But see, you are setting up a aesthetic, physical, intuition, mathematical uh, beauty framework that then could be uh, interfacing with Jerry, with Daniel, with yeah, me. That's what it's, yeah, and with Thomas Hoffman. I, I want to conclude with a prayer um, just to thank you for uh, this uh, stability you're providing, you know, in your uh, values, uh, uh, your truth has difficult path. The difficult path brings stability. And as you noted uh, that we live in a world where there's so much hurt, uh, pain, anxiety, um, uh, isolation, uh, discord, uh, lack of um just lack of human connecting. So just to, you know, and so you're doing it even without leaning on God, you know, so I, I have God in a sense for that type of stability, but I think God is uh, seeking stability that you're looking for. So, you know, if you can show like in randomness, you know, that there's this stability or in, in you know, your quantum classical connections, uh, I just very thankful to be on that journey with the difficult path um so thank you john and i think uh, it was a pleasure thank you for watching this video please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our math for wisdom discussion group and our study groups thank you for liking this video for subscribing to this youtube channel and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. It took me all of three minutes to go to Patreon to find Math for Wisdom and to sign up. And now I'm a Patreon supporter of Math for Wisdom. It was that easy.